For the message this morning, we are wrapping up a series uh, called Family Matters. This is part four. Uh, So we've spoken about uh, some of God's perspective on family. Uh, We've spoken about uh, some things just scripturally that we're to understand about family and relationships. We looked at uh, key practices that we need to understand to have healthy family relationships. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, friendships. And uh, how many, you know, have either heard somebody say or you have said yourself, uh, man, they're not just friends, they're family, right? Come on, amen? As a matter of fact, I was mentioning to somebody, uh, hey, hey, my my message is going to be moving from friendship to to family, and they said, (laughs) family. And I said, Oh, family, I get it. Yeah, yeah. So that, I think that was my first time hearing that word. I don't know if that's like, you know, most of the rest of the world and I'm just catching up. But just in case you hadn't heard that word before, it's not a typo in the notes here, all right? Family on purpose. And this journey that we move to uh, different levels of friendship. And I want to invite you this morning to take some inventory. This is a message that's meant to not just share biblical perspective, but it's a message for us to to uh, allow the Lord to speak to our hearts and show us. So what are things looking like in the friendship relationship departments of my life in this particular season that you're in right now? Uh, You you know, relationships, we're, we're talking organic, we're talking chemistry, we're talking about, you, you know, having life of their own. We're not talking about something mechanical. Uh, so, so I want us to keep it in that context. You know, there, there are these organic things that spring up, these, you know, relationships. But at the same time, I want to walk us through an understanding of different levels that we actually go through as we move to greater closeness in, in a friendship with somebody. And, you know, again, this area is one that, that touches close to the heart because when we look at relationships, the deeper the relationship goes, well, the more risk that's involved, the more chance of our heart getting hurt. You know, taking risk of rejection, all these things come into play. Uh, But what we're going to see from, you know, the Word of God as we talk this through today is relationships are worth it. They're worth the fight. They're worth the work. They're worth the effort and the intentionality. Uh, and, and we'll see. There's a variety of reasons why that is true. So, so that's where we're going to be going this morning here. We're looking at family, the journey to family. That's, that's a fun word to say. Hey, now let me, let me just get a little, little participation from you. Give me some feedback. How many have ever had a friendship where you look back on it and you realize uh, the, the friendship brought you to a place of making a bad decision. Has anybody ever had a, a friendship where, where, okay, all right, so, so yep, yep, pretty much all of us. I can remember one snowy day, uh, I want to say late elementary, maybe very early junior high, you know, I had a friend and he said, this snow is perfect for packing snowballs. And I said, you know what, you're right. And he said, these snowballs are perfect for launching at cars. I said, you know what? You're right. The only problem is, despite my best efforts, I couldn't hit a car with the snowballs. Different gift set for me, you know? So what happened is I kept moving closer and closer to the road until I was I, just, just right out in the open. This was the beginning and end of my career of crime. I realized that I'm just not wired for this, you know? But I launched a snowball, uh, and, and what came down the road was this gigantic pickup truck, which uh, I hit it this time, you know? And that gigantic struck, uh, truck jammed on its brakes, and a gigantic man got out of the gigantic truck, and he had some things to say to me that I wouldn't want to repeat, especially here, uh, having to do with breaking of limbs in my body and things like that, you know? So in that moment, I realized there's a better way to live your life, you know? But hey, we've all had it, right? Different places where we're saying, man, this friendship is not pulling the best out of me. Now, let me ask you another question. How many have had or you have friendships now and you say, man, 
they, they bless my life. They pull the best out of me. Oh, isn't that sweet, right? When you, when you know there's just people who, you're better because that person is in your life. Man, that, that's so awesome. And uh, how many have ever had a friend that stuck with you when you're going through a really hard time? And man, the difference that makes when you know you got somebody that you can lean on when times are tough. Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. So oh, the, the word of God is filled with so much to say about relationships and having them be healthy. And you know, when it really comes down to it, you know, that's the only thing that's gonna follow us to heaven are the relationships that we've been involved in. That's the only thing that's, that's gonna, you know, only area of life that impacts for eternity. And so, you, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, temporal here and now or for eternity, the choices we make with the family and the relationships around us uh, greatly determine whether we reach God's potential for our lives, whether our lives are fruit-bearing, or whether they're not. And so let's look at this, uh, again, these four circles of, of friendship, and I want to look at them from the life of Jesus. When we look in the Gospels at Jesus interacting with people all around him, we, we see these things in place. So the first level, uh, and, and I invite you, if you have a note sheet, if, if you want to follow along and fill this out, this might be a week where it's good to go back and just in, you know, quiet time with the Lord, just be asked asking him, so Lord, my, my friendships, my relationships, this is such a big deal. Lord, what are th where are things at? Talk to me, show me. So the first one is community friends, community friends. This, is, this could be uh, hundreds of people. This could be thousands of people, depending on how large your, your community circles are. But these are the people that you casually associate with uh, at gym, work, uh, here at church. There's hundreds of people that call this church home. Many we might not even know their name. Uh, people in our neighborhood, in the community. Um, the thing is, we, we know them by face and, uh, and, and by the place where we interact with them. Um, you, you know, maybe it's in the, the work room, the, the, at work, maybe it's picking up your child from school, grandchild, uh, but the relationship never goes beyond the point of commonality. You know, so you chit chat, you're friendly, these are casual friendships, but you know, one goes one way uh, as far as school, another one goes the other way, you don't keep in touch, it's just a, a casual relationship. This is the area, this is the arena from which we build deeper relationships, right? Starts off where we just meet people casually, right? It makes sense that, that we would go through. Uh, this is also the arena where we can be such a testimony for the Lord, where we can really, really let our light shine for Him. You know, just showing people what the Lord is like because we're, we're living for him. Just, just being, you know, an authentic human example. Uh, Jesus got out into the community and mixed with people from every facet of life. Don't we read about that? There was throngs of people that got all around him. And uh, look, look at Matthew chapter 9. Verses 9 to 13, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees, that's the religious leaders of the time, when they saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? See, see they had this picture of once we start following God, we kind of become this inner circle. We kind of get a step up on everybody else. Jesus was saying, you got your religion all wrong, right? We come to Christ not by our great works. The Bible makes it clear. I, I love it, the, the preacher who said it this way, our footing is leveled at the cross. All of us are at the same place when we come to the cross. And none of us can boast that we're in Christ versus somebody else. It's, it's an opportunity out of God's love that he is the, he's extended to everybody. And we receive it by faith. So Jesus is, is correcting the religious leaders. Jesus isn't partying. He isn't acting sinful. But there's, there's life in him, right? He's Jesus. And so sinners are attracted to him because they're saying, man, there's something different about this guy. 
I, I want to get around him. And actually the word tells us in other places, people wanted to get around him that were sinners and they didn't want to sin anymore. They didn't want to live that way. They wanted to live differently because they met the one who is the author of life. Right? But I tell you what, sometimes we can become so religiously minded that we completely miss, you know, or we get off, off base of, of what the gospel actually shares. So Jesus said, hey, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And so just, just a really great picture of Jesus understanding that he was there to be out among the people. And for us to understand that we are to be friends, to extend the friendship of God to the world just by living all out for him. Now, now we, we want to have a balancing statement, right, as we, as we step into situations where we want to be light for the Lord, we want to make sure that we don't step into a situation that's going to be a pitfall for us. Somebody that, that has dealt with alcohol abuse uh, might not want to be uh, making the local bar their place to establish casual friendships. Amen? Because that might be a place of, of, of stumbling, a place of temptation. You know, but the whole picture is, man, we have all even footing at the cross. Jesus loves everybody. And hey, lives matter. People matter. So how about I just go and love on the world around me and see what God does through that? just loving on people. So how do we then take these casual uh, friendships that we have and, and move them on to the next level that we're going to talk about? Well, I, I want to say first, we have to initiate a connection beyond our current setting. We have to initiate it. How many, how many you don't have to raise your hand, but how many are, are, are the type of person I'll wait until somebody else initiates with me? You know, there are some people, you know, different personality types. We might lean toward a personality that says, well, I'll just kind of wait for it. But, you know, when it comes to growing in friendships, we have to be willing to take the risk. I can remember a time with my daughters uh, when they were younger at dance school uh, and then class was about to let out and all the parents were standing there and, you know, you were kind of like sardines and I looked over and there was this dad with a Dallas Cowboys hat and a Dallas Cowboys jacket. Now don't hold this against me, all right? I'm going to tell you something here. I'm going to extend deeper level of friendship. Maybe some of you are not aware. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. So, so don't, don't let that stumble you if you're of the, uh, the Eagles or the Philistine, I mean the Giants, you know, uh, just that's all I'm going to say, you know. But, uh, but I looked over and I said, hey, point of commonality. So I walked over and, and aren't we goofy, you know, when we're fans of things? Because I didn't walk over and I didn't say the Cowboys had a good game this last week. I walked over and I said, we had a good game, my brother. Right? It was just like that, you know, and uh, he, you know what? He looked at me and he said, yeah, and he, and he turned and looked away. I was like, oh, snubbed and rejected. <laughs> you know, that can make it that much harder to go ahead and, and, and reach out. We have to be willing to have that happen and say that's okay. You know, uh, even, you know, sometimes here at a church our size, people will look around and say, um, how, do, how do I, you know, get to know people more? The best thing that we can do is take initiative uh, to reach out and, and uh, say hello to folks, right? And then also we can do random acts of kindness. You know, uh, just realizing that there is this principle, it's a physical principle, it's a spiritual principle of sowing and reaping, and just making the decision that we're going to add value to people in whatever way we can. And, and again, just, just see what happens in the process there. Can you say amen? amen. All right, so uh, then, then that would move us to this next level here, this next step in, in relationship, and this one is companionship. So uh, this is the group of people that we would say, hey, this is who I do life with. You know, for Jesus, this was the, the uh, 12 disciples that he hung around with, right? Just hung around with his 12 disciples. And, and Jesus wasn't just their religious teacher. He shared his life. He shared his heart. He did life with them. And then we see that picture and that model uh, move on to the early church. We can look at it. Let's look in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves, this is the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Notice they were devoted to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So there's crazy generosity uh, going on. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Notice here, you know, meeting in the temple courts and then from house to house. You know, so our modern day picture, meeting in the temples, that's, that's the big meeting. Like when we come together here at church on Sunday. But then it says also they met from house to house, smaller meetings like our, our small groups, you know, that we have in, in different smaller ministries and then just, just friendship circles that meet and get together. Uh, and it goes on to say they were praising God in verse 47 and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So certainly on this level, uh, this, this companionship level, you, you know, uh, there's, there's greater commonality, there's greater connection that we feel. Certainly here in, in a, you know, the, the church setting, right? Having people that we connect with on a spiritual level. Man, isn't that just like a drink of water? You know, where, where you're talking to somebody who says, I know, I have the same values, I have the same priorities, the same understanding of the world. Man, that, that's precious. We call it like precious faith. You know, uh, but then other uh, companionship relationships uh, is a common goal and, and interest. Maybe people are work partners and you're, you know, moving on the same career path and you've got these goals that you're, you know, you're sacrificing and working hard for and, and you're moving on, you, you know, in that direction. Maybe it's, uh, you know, sharing the same hobby. You know, people got to know other people uh, golfing, other hobbies, things like that. Uh, an another characteristic here of this companionship level, a lot of times people are at the same age and stage of life, you know, young marrieds, uh, empty nesters. <clears throat> <laughs> there, there was a couple visiting uh, a little while back, um, maybe about a year ago in the welcome room, and uh, there were empty nesters, and they said, yeah, we sold our house, and then we moved down here, uh, and we got a smaller house. And I said, oh, well, that's so nice. And they said, we did that so our kids couldn't move back home. We like being empty nesters, you know? And I went, <laughs> and they went, I'm serious. <laughs> You know, I said, all right, all right, yeah, yeah, all right, you're serious on it, and there's other empty nesters, but it's a different life phase, right? And, and to experience that with others, man, there can be real common connection. And then we could say these are the people who probably fill up our, our social calendar. We meet for lunch, uh, might, um, you know, do holidays with them, maybe even take vacations and things together. Uh, so how would we now, from this level, so we move from casual to companionship, uh, and, and then how would we move now to the next level that I'll bring up in just a minute? Well, you know, we start paying attention for who do I have a kindred spirit with? You know, who do I just feel a connection with? Who, who do I interact with where what we said earlier, man, man, they just bring the best out of me. You know, they, they just, they pull me higher. I want to be a better person when I'm around this person. How great is that, right? Uh, and then also the other thing to realize is at this level, there needs to be a commitment of time and a building of trust. Now, how many know you can't, you can't microwave trust? Trust happens over time. As a matter of fact, uh, you, you know, uh, they, they tell us, sociologists, so forth, that it's about two years to really build deep trust with another person. So, so this isn't, you know, like a microwave thing. Like I said, this is more of a, you know, simmering long-term. This is why over the years as a pastor so many times and, you know, first working all those years with young people and young adults, you know, people would start to date and, you know, say, this is serious, this is the one and things like that. And I would usually encourage them, do not even, like, allow yourself to think that thought for six months. You know, and they would say, well, why do you say that? Because I can fake it for six months. You know, put a best impression on, you know, not really, really, after six months, you really have a good handle of the good, the bad, and the ugly in that person's life, right? And also, there's an opportunity to build track record, to build trust, and to move forward, uh, you, you know, um, in, in whatever that looks like in, in that relationship. So, so that would move us then on to the third level here. Everybody tracking so far? Yep, amen. Give, all right. Uh, level three is now we move to close friends. So notice Jesus with the crowds, then Jesus with the twelve. How many know Jesus had a couple of close friends, right? Jesus loves everybody, but whenever we say Jesus doesn't have favorites, we're actually not correct. 
That's not the biblical picture there. And he had three close friends, right? Peter, James, and John. We read about it in the Word. And so when we look at close friends, that's usually that, that small handful of people, uh, two to four, that, that those relationships supersede any other relationships in our lives. And again, Jesus had Peter, James, and John. That's where you stand in faith together during life's most difficult situations. So take a look here at Luke chapter 8, verse 49. It says, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, uh, and said, your daughter is dead. Now, now we were jumping into the story midstream. Jesus was on his way to go and pray for her. Uh, don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. And when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him. Interesting church, except for Peter, John, and James. All the others stayed outside. You know, he brought in, you know, the the closest there that he knew where they were uh, in their belief of God. And of course, he brought in the parents because they have the the, the most vested interest in their child um, and and prayed and and, and, uh, Jesus uh, raised the daughter from the dead. Uh, In the Old Testament, we look, look at Moses. He's in the battle of a lifetime against the Amalekites. So the Israelites are, a lot of ites, right? The Israelites are fighting the Amalekites and God gives Moses the instruction, you're gonna stand up on the mountain and you're gonna lift your rod, you're gonna hold that up over your head. And while he held the rod up over his head, the Israelites would prevail in battle against the enemy. Whenever Moses would start to drop and lower his hands, the Israelites would start to falter and the enemy would start to prevail. Think about that for a minute. God's will, God's ultimate victory for Israel, for Moses, God gave him a situation that he couldn't do by himself. We, we cannot approach our Christianity as islands unto ourselves. We can't approach life, doing life, saying, I don't need anybody else. I'll just do it on my own. This is such an incredible picture to me that God told him victory is going to come. It, it tells us, we'll read it in just a second, that, that this went on until sunset. So we're talking hours and hours and hours. He was not physically capable of holding his arms up, you know, that, that, that high, you, you know, for that extended period of time. So we read that Aaron and her came alongside and each one held an arm. They put a rock underneath him where he could sit down. And together they enforced God's command and they enforced God's victory. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it interesting? Every one of us will stand before God and given an account for our life. We'll all stand before him. And when we do, there won't be friends alongside. We won't be able to say, it's their fault, it's their fault. We will have to take responsibility for our lives. In that moment, it's one-on-one. But here and now on earth, as we walk through this life, he has said, we're not to do it one-on-one. We need to get those around us that will help us become the best that God has called us to be. Amen? Doesn't that give us such a, a fresh picture and a vision? How many, I, I, don't want, I don't want to look at the people around me and say, they're worse off because they know me. I want to live in such a way where I can bring out the best in those around me. Right? And that's what these guys did here. Let's look at it in Exodus 17. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and they put it under him. And he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. All right, another thing about friendship at this level of close friendship is there is a complete transparency and authenticity, right? When we move to the level of close friends, remember, trust was established on this previous level. Now trust is going to a deeper level where we're saying, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be real. I'm going to keep it real. 
good, bad, and ugly, here's who I am. Let, let, let's climb onward and upward together. And again, I love it. We see in the life of Jesus, um, man, he exposes his, his nature and his inward person, again, with his three closest friends. We see a picture of Jesus on the mountain. We see a picture of Jesus when he's in his valley. Let's take a look at Mark 14. It says, they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Now, the cross is all that's going to happen on the cross. They're just, it's just about to happen, right? And Jesus is, is feeling the weight of what he's going to do on the cross to bear the sin of the world. And he says to them, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. There's Jesus just so transparently saying, Lord, if there's another way, take this cup. But Lord, not my will, yours be done. And as he's working through this, he takes Peter, James, and John along with him to, 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 to be shoulder to shoulder with him as he walks through this valley. Then there's a mountaintop experience that we read about where it says Jesus went on top of the mountain and it tells us in scripture he was transfigured before them. So Jesus, the eternally existing second member of the Trinity, Son of God, takes on flesh, right? That's what we celebrate at Christmas, you know? And that's, you know, they're, they're, seeing, they're seeing God, you know, his Godhood pouring out of him as he walks as a man. Now they get this picture behind the scenes. He's transfigured, you know? And he's, I, I can't imagine what that picture looked like for them. But, you know, his, uh, you, you know, uh, his buddies there say, this is pretty cool. Let's build a couple of tabernacles up here. Let, let's, let's just make a little residence up here and hang out because this is awesome. You know, and God has to interject and basically tells, tells them, shut up and listen to him. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know, and it says that they came down off the mountain. They didn't speak of it right away. You know, Jesus, you know, it's almost like you can get this picture of Jesus knew because he's interacting with a couple of the Old Testament saints that went before him, all strengthening him before he's going to the cross, right? And, and rather than going up on the mountain, he says, and take my buds with me and take my buddies up so they can check this out as well, right? So uh, how do we then look at this level? So now it's close friendships. But I said there's four levels. There's one more that we can move to here. And before I list it, how can we move out to it? Well, we have to ask God to make these divine connections. We got to let the Lord put it together. And, and the next level, that, and the last one we'll talk about here, is covenant friends. Covenant friends. And one of the greatest examples of this connection was Jesus and uh, John. You know, I talked about Peter, James, and John. But all through the, uh, the Gospel of John, he referred to himself as the apostle that Jesus loved. That's the Bible language for the one who was Jesus' favorite, his very best friend. Yeah, and you could just imagine how that went over with the, with the other disciples because they all squabbled over who was going to be the best, right? So uh, th there was a connection with John, a best friend connection. You know, uh, the, the other example, of course, when we look at covenant friendships uh, is we look at the covenant of marriage, right? There, there's um, a spiritual covenant between two people. As a matter of fact, when we look at marriage, right, it's, it's uh, a two people plus God in the mix. It's this supernatural union where two whole people become one in Christ. Matthew 19 says, uh, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So, so you know, marriage as a covenant, you know, we, we can understand that in the church, outside the church, marriage has become a contract. It's become an agreement, you know, but covenant is a deeper level. A contract is I will if you will, 
Covenant is we're partnered together. Here's what I'll be. Here's what I'll be. And we just hang in and we fight through for it. Uh, This bond will exceed even our biological family relationships. That's where we started this out. You know, a lot of people will say, hey, these are my friends, but they're really my family. Proverbs 18.24 says, there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Wow. Wow closer than a brother. And, and then in the Old Testament, we see, uh, oops, we see a beautiful example of this uh, with Jonathan. Uh, if you don't know the story in the Old Testament, so Jonathan is the son of King Saul. King Saul is the first king of Israel, called by God to be king. Uh, and uh, the only problem is Saul doesn't continue to follow God's commands. And so he eventually has it told to him by the prophet God's taken the kingdom away from you. You're no longer going to be king. I'm going to give it over to somebody who's a man after my own heart. And that turns out to be David. And so now Saul has a son, Jonathan. God is beginning to work in David's life, and David's being a blessing to the king, to Israel. And Jonathan and David become really, really good friends. And to talk about the kind of covenant friend that Jonathan is, and he's heir to be the king. You know, he could have sold David out, had David, you know, uh, tried to have him killed or whatever else to say, man, I'm next up after, you know, my dad passes, I get to be king. But instead, he saw God's hand on David's life. And it was so obvious that God had anointed David that this guy was willing to say, to have earthly power handed to me outside of God's will, rather than be a covenant friend with you who God has called, uh, I'm not going to have it. I'm your covenant friend. You can trust me. And he wound up being just such a, a dear friend to him. In verse, uh, verse 1 of 1 Samuel 18, it says, After David finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, uh, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. You know, so we look at covenant friendships, and those are, those are the relationships where we say, hey, I can entrust what's most important, what's most valuable to me, uh, you, you know, into the hands of, of these covenant friendships. You know, I can think of when, when my kids were younger, and my wife and I spoke, God forbid if anything untimely were to happen to us, who would we ask to raise our kids? Covenant friendships. People who carry our heart, carry our values, where we could just with peace know that our kids would have the kind of values put into their life that that are so important to us. So this picture of covenant friendship, again, we see what a beautiful picture of of what I'm illustrating here. John 13, um, this is uh, (laughs) Last Supper, and Jesus tells all of his disciples, tonight one of you is going to betray me. So Peter looks over at John, because he's the disciple that Jesus loved. John keeps reminding us. And and John, uh, Peter looks over at John and says, ask him, who is it? And so John kind of leans over to Jesus and says, which one of us, Lord? And, you know, Jesus leans back and he says, I'm dipping bread in the dish. It's going to be the one I hand it over to. See, when you first read that, you can almost think, did Jesus announce that to everybody? It is the one, depending on on where we read this, it is the one I hand the bread to that will betray me. That's totally not what happened here. This was Jesus, and his inner circle buddies were like, I got to know who it is. And Jesus said, I'm going to hand bread to him. That's who I'm talking about. You know, And, and then we see Jesus later on on the cross. He's dying on the cross. Covenant friendships. And he says, John, Jesus points to his mother Mary, John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. Thinking about his mom. Isn't that that amazing? Bearing the sin of the world on his shoulders as he's dying this agonizing death on a cross. He's concerned about his mom after he's gone. Right? And and who does he turn to in that that, that process there? It's his covenant friend. And, and so as we look at this picture of these different levels of relationship, how does it look? How's, how is it laid out in your life? There's the casual friendships. Here, here's, we're coming in for a closing here. The casual friendships. Um, have you allowed yourself, do you carry the approach to them 
to say, Lord, I want to add value. I want to be light. I want to be a blessing. I want to look for the opportunities to show your heart and your love to the world around me. And then in the area of companionship, how's it going in the companionship area? How many know friendships, and, and, and again, back to family relationships, some of the greatest joy, some of the greatest pain, you know, can, can come as we open our heart up to others. And as we move deeper in this circle, we give people greater permission to potentially bring more pain to our hearts. And, and you know what? If we're not careful, we can have someone bring hurt to our life. And we can turn around and say, you know what? I know how to fix that. I'll just close the door of my heart and I'll never let anybody in again. And that's just what the enemy wants. Because again, as we go back, we're not meant to do it alone. We're not meant to walk through life alone. Not only what the blessing is that can come into our lives, but then the blessing that we can be to others around us. So we're going to pray at, at the end of the service here and just have an opportunity. If there is anybody who's saying, you know what, in this area of, uh, you know, companionship, close friendships, covenant uh, friendships, you know, uh, it's not gone, gone well, or I've been wounded, I've had some pains. Let's just give God the opportunity to work in those areas and heal those areas. It can be hard work. And you want to know what? When things are in a healthy place, they don't stay in a healthy place. They'll, they'll fall into neglect if we don't stay intentional to keep those relationships healthy uh, and moving forward, you know? And as we go through life and different seasons change, people will come and go out of our lives. I, I was 19 when I met the Lord, and, uh, you, you know, so 19 years of living by our world's way. I'll put it that way, you know? 19 years old, I met the Lord, and I can remember the first conversation I had with somebody from college after I had given my heart to Christ, and they called up and he said, I am having an epic party at my house this weekend. You need to come. And I said, actually, you know what? I'm not, I'm not, not doing that anymore. I'm not drinking anymore because I met Jesus and oh man, he's changed everything in my life. And his response was, ah, oh, too bad. And he hung up. And that was the last I heard from him. And I thought, that's interesting. You know, I would have put him, you know, moving toward the close friendship circle. But, you know, as values start to change, I can remember then other friends who, you, you know, some who had said, wow, I, I see this change in your life. It seems like your life is improving. I've had others who have said, you're not walking in the same direction as me. I, I, can't, I can't walk in that direction with you. You know, and they, they would say, I'm going left, you're going right. You know, have a nice life kind of a thing. And so there's been periods of time where it's been, uh, you, you know, the response could be, well, I don't need anybody. You, you know, or I'll just close the door of my heart. And I can remember as, as a, being a, a believer for long enough and then starting into ministry and looking around and saying, man, I, I feel like I don't have any really close friends. Come on, can we just have an honest conversation for a minute here? I don't know that I have any covenant friends. And I, I asked, Lord, would you, would you send me really close friends? Yeah, I, I've heard it called foxhole friends, friends you'd want to be in a foxhole with when the mortars are blown up all around you. And I can remember it being work, and I can remember just, just offering and opening up, and you want to know it, not every friendship is meant to be close and covenant, and that's okay, right? You know, but working through and finding out, and then I can remember, uh, you know, when God started positioning people in my life where it was like, oh, okay, this is close friends. Ah, this is covenant friends. But it was not, um, again, it was not microwave. So I just want to encourage us where, you know, I, I started this whole closing here. This is my second closing. Started this whole closing here looking at, okay, so as we look at the, the circles of friendship in our lives, different seasons, you might say, well, hey, I had close friends, but what happened there? Or, you know, I had covenant friends, but life has changed. That's not really in place right now. Uh, let, let's take a look. And, and I tell you what, we have gone through together in this last couple of years uh, very, 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 very interesting times. There's been hardships and there's been challenges 
in, in, in history and in our lives, but I don't think quite like what we went through in these last couple of COVID years that were so polarizing and so redefining of relationships, friendships, values, and there was a, there was a big shuffling that went on. Shuffling is putting it nicely, right? I mean, wounds, hurts, anger, bitterness, offenses, struggles, loneliness, all kinds of stuff around us that if we're not careful, that becomes fodder for the enemy to have us limp the rest of the way through life or, or not be open to investing in the friendships and the relationships that he wants us to invest into. Come on, can you say amen? amen. Hopefully it's landing because it got real quiet in here. Amen. Amen. And like I said, I realize we're dealing with stuff close to the heart, tender stuff, but uh, boy, the goal would be that we would leave today just willing to say, okay, Lord, I'm listening for your voice, and I am aware. I, I tell you what, it, I, I don't know that I ever heard it speak so loudly to me when I looked at Moses, you know, to realize God has designed this life in such a way where I won't be able to fulfill his command in my life without you. And it's the same for you. Isn't that sobering? But you know, when we realize that, we'll pay the prices. We'll roll up our sleeves. We'll, we'll deal with what we have to deal with in order to be people of relationship that will walk through casual into companionship, into close friends, and then covenant friends. Can you say Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray as we close. Well, Father, today we are so grateful that when it comes to relationship, you said, I go first. Our whole faith is that we would know you, that we would be in fellowship and relationship with you. And that was so important to you that you sent Jesus to die for us so that the sin that separates us from you could be dealt with and forgiven and that price could be paid in what Jesus did on the cross. And we thank you, Jesus, for being our very best friend. And so, Lord, here today, just around this room, we affirm and we acknowledge that you are number one. We give you first place in our lives. And now, Lord, we just lift up the circles of influence around us, the, the circles that would be casual friendships. And we ask, God, that you would help us take inventory if there's any that are um, influencing, influencing us toward bad decisions, influencing us away from that which is healthy and life-giving. Lord, help us to see it, help us to be aware, and then show us how to navigate that, that we wouldn't be subject to that. Lord, in our casual relationships and friendships, Lord, show us how to add value to others. Show us how to love and serve and how to be available. Help us to listen for your voice when you're encouraging us to be a friend to others. And then, Lord, in our uh, in companionship, Lord, even more so, Lord, show us how uh, to be the friend that we desire. Father, in our close friendships, in our covenant relationships. Lord, first of all, if there's any gap or, or missing spaces in these areas, Lord, would you bring into our lives those that would be life-giving, those that would be close, those that would be, those that we could be in covenant with. Lord, we pray for marriages, our marriages, those covenant relationships. And we pray that you'd breathe fresh life, fresh favor, fresh anointing, And finally, Lord, wherever we have been wounded, Lord, wherever there has been pain from relationships that we're still harboring, that we're still carrying, that have closed us off, that have wounded or damaged us, Lord, we choose to trust you this morning with those hurts and with those pains. And God, we pray that you'd come and heal those areas now. That you would come and do what only you can do in those areas. We put our trust in you. 
And God, in all of this, it's in the precious, mighty name of Jesus that we pray.